Welcome everyone. My name is Ben Wilkes. I'm the program manager at the TomTom Tom Foundation. And on top of a, on, on behalf of our, our staff and our board, I'd like to welcome you to today's conversation, um, as well as the two-day um, event series we have scheduled for this week, uh, entitled Legalize It, The Path to Cannabis Equity in Virginia. Um, this series is a collaboration with our partners at Virginia Normal, who we're uh, grateful and excited to be um, partnering with in this way. The series was designed to educate and empower advocates for cannabis policy reform in advance of the 2021 Virginia General Assembly session. And the focus of the event will be on a series of community conversations around key issues that elevate coalition building efforts and reinforce sustainable ideas for the implementation of cannabis policy reform in Virginia cities. I am thrilled today to introduce the first talk of the series. Uh, it is titled Lessons Learned building an equitable future via cannibal, cannabis legislation and community reinvestment, where we will hear from federal and state level perspective on legalization from folks who have begun to blaze the trail. With that, I'd like to bring on our moderator, John Hudick. He's the deputy director of the Center for Effective Public Management and a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. John, I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Ben, for the introduction. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. I'd like to thank the TomTom Tom Foundation and Virginia Normal for organizing this event, um, especially Jen Michelle Padini, who's one of the hardest working advocates I know in the cannabis policy space uh, nationwide. And Virginia is lucky to have her uh, really working hard in Richmond and elsewhere to make sure that uh, reform becomes a reality in the Commonwealth. It's my pleasure to moderate a conversation today on a panel titled Lessons Learned, Building an Equitable Future via Cannabis Legalization and Community Reinvestment. And I cannot think of anyone better to uh, participate in this conversation than Toy Hutchinson. Uh, Toy is a senior advisor on cannabis policy to Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker. Uh, she's essentially Illinois' cannabis czar. Uh, and is in charge of one of the newest cannabis reform programs. Although I, I guess, Toy, that's now starting to get outdated now that Virginia, uh, Vermont rather has created a commercial system. We have four new states that legalized on election day, but nonetheless, um, it is the, the newest up and running system uh, in the United States. And so, uh, Toy, uh, you are in charge of uh, a, a remarkable system, one that I sing the praises of all the time, uh, it's, a, it's a big system, uh, but it's one that better than any other in the United States really focuses on issues of racial justice, social equity, community reinvestment. It focuses on a lot of the issues that were left out of the policy conversation in the early states that legalized. And while the program and its goals in those areas are particularly ambitious, um, I think they are uh, the right ones moving in the right direction. But for our viewers, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the outlines of this program and how it works for those who, who are unfamiliar? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, Illinois was the 11th state to go legal uh, for adult use. We did have a very small, but a pretty well-regulated medical program um, that started in 2014. And so in 2019, we got it over the fish line for adult use and it had it was a, a really big comprehensive bill so we were the first state to do it legislatively rather than a ballot initiative which meant hundreds and hundreds of hours of town halls and stakeholder building bill or meetings and a lot of people across the state that were for it against it agnostic or and then passionately so whatever silo they came from so what we ended up with was a three-pronged approach that talked about um, how do you change the face of the industry? What do you do with the money? And how do you undo past harms? So from the beginning, we were very, very lucky to have a governor that chose to, that put this in his platform when he was running. So my legislative friends, I, I served in the Senate for a little over 10 years and was part of the core four that carried this bill. Um, they, call, they started calling us the marijuana moms. It was four women from across the state to talk about this in a different, you know, we just want to talk about it in a different way. And the driving force from beginning was we cannot normalize and legalize an activity for whom the exact same prohibition of that activity destroyed whole communities. It, it's just that's that's the premise of what, it, what is the Illinois what is the what is Illinois approach? The governor said for full full line 
that if this were only about money to the state, it would be a very different looking bill. That we wanted to do this for people, that it was about justice. It was about taking this 80 plus year failed war on drugs and drawing a direct nexus to the people who were most harmed by that as we were doing this legalization. So we would all go around and talk to people and say, first, let's just level set. There's millions and millions of dollars being transacted right now. While at the same time, depending on the year that we're talking about, we started this in 17 or so, six to 800,000 people arrested for cannabis use and possession every single year across this country. And the numbers are not going down even in legal states in terms of arrests and, and, and um, um, interactions with law enforcement. And that takes its effect on so many different ways. And so this, if the first premise was draw a direct nexus to the people who are most harmed by this, then the next question was how? How? You don't get racial justice without economic justice. So licensure and ownership had to be a part of this. Um, we knew that communities that had been hardest hit by the war on drugs have all the same indices that we struggle to fund from a governmental standpoint. Anyway, high, rate, high arrest records, high, high rates of returning citizens, um, under education and underemployment. All those things exist in communities where we know if there are high educational indices, and high um, employment indices, you don't see rubber blitz and riot gear um, when there's unrest. Those communities, you don't see those in those communities. So one out of every four dollars that's spent on cannabis in Illinois forever will be directed to the communities that were hardest hit by the prohibition of this activity. Um, and hopefully by the end of this year, uh, we identified 770,000 records, criminal records, to be sealed, pardoned, or expunged, or some combination of the three. We gave ourselves a five-year timeline to do that. But um, um, we are really on track now to getting rid of our 500,000 arrest records by the end of the calendar year and three years ahead of schedule. Um, this is serious. It's significant. It's intersectional and layered in ways that I think most people don't give cannabis the full uh, breadth of what this is. It's criminal justice reform, it's drug policy reform, and it ought be a case study in how you reinvest in the communities that were hurt the most. That's, that's the outline of what it is we do. I, I love how you frame that, Toy, as, as being something that uh, you know, is essentially full spectrum. It involves a lot. It involves a lot of uh, sort of puzzle pieces, uh, but also your comment about you don't achieve racial equity in, until you also achieve economic equity is so important. One of the things I often talk about is that people who are new to the cannabis conversation <laughs> or people from outside the cannabis conversation, um, think of this as just something about a plant or a joint or a bowl, um, but it's such a complex area of public policy. And the more that you work in this space, the more you appreciate that cannabis touches a lot of lives um, for a lot of reasons, but it also touches a ton of areas of public policy. And it makes a program, an ambitious program like Illinois, um, uh, all that much uh, uh, important to uh, what is happening in that state and what the state's needs are. Uh, but as this program has rolled out, now it's still early on again, uh, but can you talk a little bit about some of the successes that you've seen? You, you touched a little bit on it in, in framing yeah. what the program looks like and, and, and what that is doing for Illinois residents. Well, number one, um, some, it, we, we started everything at the same time. So this is like the three prongs of this uh, law began simultaneously. So while there is a lot of a lot of interest in who's going to get the license, which is the same in every state, like this, the the thing that happens when licenses are let out, all the incumbent lawsuits and all the things like that, all of that happens in every state whenever another uh, letting goes. But we didn't want to take the emphasis on why we did what we did. So one of the main main things was that we knew we were going through budgetary challenges, and we knew that it was going to be very difficult to fund a program as ambitious as this. So we built it all. It is literally all attached to the plan. So the original, we did the flip the switch model. So you took your medical industry, which are were already ready to be up and running and have product available. They started ramping up ahead of time. Didn't stop us from having still supply issues as adult, you know, as adult use comes on board. However, those original operators are who we charged to fund a revolving business loan. We established a $31 million business loan to assist with social equity applicants 
because one of the, the two of the things that we saw first was that a huge barrier is access to property, another barrier is access to capital. And when you talk about access to capital, you're talking about, again, if you draw the nexus, if you draw the nexus to the people who are most harmed by this, those are also people who are not gonna have, the, there, there may be credit issues. It's not like anybody's walking around here with just millionaire friends to say, hey, you got a hundred grand, you got, you got a million, let's all join together so we can go do this business venture. Our communities don't operate like that. So we had to figure out a way to give business support for people who wanted to get into that business. And the original operators and starting the program when we did was the way we funded that mechanism. The second thing was that 25% of all the dollars go into a program that we created called the um, R3. It's a reinvest, renew and, and rebuild. So we call it, that's our community investment thing. We then drew maps to tie to that, to say, who are the communities that are hardest hit by drugs? What are the indices that look like that? And what are the agencies and nonprofits and social service safety networks on the ground that do all this work, who are always the first to be cut in budgetary cycles? Because you know the thing, the thing that goes to people is what we call discretionary. So those are always the first things to be cut. So if we wanted to like really look at this with an equity lens, like every single silo had to have an equity lens, then the dollars that people spend on this product need to be redirected back into the communities that were hurt by the prohibition of the product. I sometimes sound like a broken record like that. And I'm super proud of that, especially when we saw the presidential you know, campaigns happen and, and pretty much <laughs> when people started talking about it now, they talk about like, you can't say cannabis without following the word equity. And that gives us an opportunity then, which I think is another it's another win um, in the movement that's sweeping this country right now is that equity is a, equity in this space is about taking communities who have been harmed and giving them what they need to be in a position to be treated equally. That is not, that is, that is not diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion can be defined as we want our organizations to look like our, the communities that we represent, the diversity and the wonderfulness of what makes us who we are. Both of those things are incredibly important. But when you understand how significantly, uh, how, sig how significant um, the criminal justice system was and how intentional it was in the communities that it impacted, then, then looking at it from that lens means you can't separate the two. So every single decision point comes back to that point so that we could draw a direct line nexus. The other thing that we did was we drew the program race neutral. And that was, that was controversial at the time. Um, we understood the judiciary. We understood that when, whenever you get into race specific um, policy area, you're in a strict scrutiny um, background, very difficult for the state to with, withstand that challenge. So we specifically wanted to draw criteria for whom anybody could meet, but know that the community that was the hardest hit by the war on drugs is 55% African-American and 24% Latinx. So the, the people who bore the brunt of this, uh, it's not as though you can, we could create a system that would bar uh, wealthy people from, from participating or would bar big cannabis from participating, but we had to intentionally draw a program that created this, the conditions by which we can compete too. So gone are the days when it's gonna be okay for billions of dollars to transact around this country for the federal government to turn a blind eye as though it is not already de facto legal if you're privileged and behave as though the only thing we can talk about when it comes to black and brown communities is letting them out of jail. So our, our uh, focus on this, um, oh, and I'll tell you one more really good thing is we built into this law knowing that there would be problems. Like remember this launched on January 1st. In Feb and by the end of February, we started moving into COVID and a pandemic. Nobody knew what it was like to be able to govern in the middle of a global plague um, at the height of an election season, not knowing really how this is going to shape out at all. But the, one of the best things we did in structure, stru structuring this was a slow, multi-phase, multi-year rollout. It was never designed to do it everything or solve every issue in the first year. What it is designed to do is to identify unintended consequences so that you can assess what works and fix what doesn't. Imagine if we had done that in any other area of public policy, that we just that we're not going to do another thing until we decide whether the thing that we just did worked. 
So this builds in a disparity study. This builds in market research. This builds in no licenses are let until this does what it is we want to do. And so it's the perfect example to me of even for mistakes and flaws and even for lawsuits and all the rest of those things, that for people who are, who are looking at us right now, our, our hopes and dreams and the things that we would like to dismantle after 80 years are now all being addressed in three co-equal branches of government. It's in the courts, it's in the legislature, it is um, in the, with, with the administration. We are literally looking at this from all sides. So I like to tell people, um, since I was the first woman uh, to be in this statewide capacity, we're birthing an industry. And that means we're in labor and labor hurts and contractions are necessary. And the only, only thing I know to do, no matter how hard it gets, is to push. <laughs> so this is hard. <laughs> Um, Choi, I, I want to pick up on one of the points that you made. I think when a lot of people think about targeting community reinvestment to the victims of the war on drugs or the community's hardest hit, people immediately think of uh, Black and Brown Americans. But can, you, you noted that uh, this program is, in a sense, colorblind. Can you talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about how you identify specifically the communities that are getting those funds reinvested back into them? What, what system, what data you use? We use census tract data. We used um, Medicaid and SNAP benefit data. We used rates, of, we used arrest rates. We used rates of returning citizens. We used, uh, those are the kinds of, of metrics that you would look at to build these almost like heat areas, map, maps to say where, where are the pockets of where this happens. That does not mean that there's not somebody white who was arrested ridiculously for a cannabis thing. Um, and then when you look at the way we did the application for the licensure, there's points there for like, have you been arrested as somebody in your immediate family have an arrest or a conviction as it relates to this? Have you lived in a disproportionately impacted area for a number of years? Um, or, so, that, so that we could look to see whether or not those equity points are hitting the person individually or whether they were assembling a team that made up those things. What ended up happening was that we ended up getting three times the amount of applications in any state before us on this. And the, and the participation on behalf of the community was through, it was through the roof, just because, you know, we looked at things like lower, lower the amount of license fees, lower or lower how much it's gonna cost to do an application. Um, people were enticed by the, the revolving business loan. People were enticed by the fact that, uh, the application fully 20% of the application is about your social equity points. And what's wonderful and not wonderful because we're still trying to work through all this stuff is that every challenge we have, we don't have one on race yet, which means that the pillars of the thing not only targeted the community that we were attempting to target, meaning, you know, 55% African-American and 24% Latino, the, the numbers shook out like that. Um, but you can't dismantle it. Um, using race. Uh, this is, we, we want to be in the rational basis area. We don't be in the strict scrutiny area. <laughs> um, we really want this to survive and grow and get better every single year. So the community reinvestment piece is tied to, again, sales. And we're not a year old yet. We started January 1. We're now moving into this wonderful month called December. And we've already hit $500 million in sales. So, so the first NOFO that went out is almost $32 million to communities who were not going to get that money in any other kind of way. Now, Toy, it sounds like the data you're using uh, is a combination of historical data and current data in terms of identifying which communities um, are going to be targeted for the reinvestment. I, I think that's such an important step, right? I live in Washington, D.C. Um, I know the same is true in places like Chicago and elsewhere. Uh, gentrification is really transforming some communities. So uh, there are neighborhoods here in D.C. that 20 years ago were probably very heavily targeted for uh, drug arrests and now in 2020 are all white and wealthy. Uh, right. And so uh, I think there's a a focus too often, I think, on just the arrest records, which can really disproportionately um, uh, sort of mask what is actually happening at the community level in a city or, or statewide. I mean, gentrification is happening in a lot of places. And so the last thing you want is for this community reinvestment money to go to a gentrified neighborhood because, it, because of what it used to look like. And it, but it sounds like the program is responsive to that. 
Uh, yeah, we tried to look at people. So it, people, because there's a there was a big concern about that. Like literally, how do you get this to people? Um, and people are transient and move. And it's just like now we live in a community where it's like if you are working, you typically aren't working someplace for longer than seven years. Nobody's working somewhere for thirty years. You get the company watch and the pin at the end. Like people are moving around a lot. And specifically to that gentrification point, we had to do we added a look back. So it's like a look back to when those communities look like how we know they used to look. <laughs> and multiple layers, like whether or not it was you that had a conviction or whether it was somebody like your your son or daughter or husband or wife or mother or father. Because it was, we needed to acknowledge the fact that these policies that have been ingrained for so long in this country have impacts that literally impact, not, not just the person that it happened to, but every every person around who that happened to. So when you have a community that has a large number of returning rates of citizens, and one of the things that goes with parole is you can't be around other people who are on parole. So, so now, how, how is law enforcement using the ability to walk up on your porch to see who you're talking to and who is this, and then using the cannabis thing to get in the middle of that? Like there's, this is, I would always um, point out to people that you know, for all the hand-wringing about gateway drugs, which I would contend would be cigarettes and alcohol, cannabis may, is not a gateway drug, but it is a gateway conviction. Yeah. It is a gateway conviction. It is one of the first ways people get in, introduced, especially young, young African-American boys between 18 and 24, introduced into the criminal justice system. And that has impacts for the rest of their lives, for all of their families, for whole blocks and blocks of people. So the, one, of the, one of the reasons why we wanted to be as comprehensive as we were about this was because if not now, when? Because most times when you bring this up, um, and I'll just say this, it's offensive to talk to me about cannabis and be just fine with, um, well, you know, what's the problem? We're, you know, I hear all this expungement stuff and I hear all this, we're going to get rid of the records. Like, what's the problem when you don't think about the business of this? When you really, if you, when you really think about it, it's even more insidious that we have to go through these spe special mechanisms to undo the harms that happen on people's lives and still make it so that they can't participate in ownership opportunities and in ownership opportunities for the entire ecosystem. It's not just about the dispensary and the cultivation center. It's the supply chain, it's the vendors, it's the who does the marketing, who does the legal, who does the advertising, who does, who's, who's doing the HVAC systems, who's handling waste, who does labeling and packaging and all of those things. Like we have an opportunity to actually grow businesses inside a community that is desperately needing it and doing that for this group of people is not taking anything from anybody else. So when you when you wrap all of that into them, then you can see how how layered the cannabis conversation is. And it is not, it is not, and don't let anybody, anybody who's listening to this, don't let anybody like drag you down the rabbit hole of the jokes and the laughs and the cynicism and the sarcasm and the gaslighting about how this is not a big deal. This has been an extremely big deal. And if it wasn't, it would not have been this ingrained and structural and entrenched for almost 90 years. There's a reason why the industry looks the way it does. There's a reason why the prison population looks the way it does because systems are designed to produce what they are. Does They will produce what they're designed to produce. And the only way to change what they produce is to change the damn system. No, well said, Toy, and and the comments on uh, in the chat right now, they are they want you to run for president. So uh, <laughs> ready. Um, it sounds like you have a campaign team already ready to go just just from this seminar. Uh, but you know, it, it's 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 such a great point you made, and I think one of the things that is also important for people to remember is once legalization happens in a state, or if it happens nationally. That is not the end of the road. Okay. That is the, the race has then begun to yep. solve these issues. That is the beginning of a process, whether it's a, a very challenging administrative and regulatory process, or more importantly, the process of actually trying to address a lot of these racial and social justice issues. Um, legalization doesn't fix that. Legalization creates an environment in which fixes can happen. 
Um, but when you look at a lot of the early states, um, those fixes didn't happen. Racial disparities and arrest rates have endured in a lot of the early states and some places gotten worse, even as um, arrests have dropped. And so the, the worst thing, and it's true in a lot of areas of public policy, once one step is taken, people think, well, that's fixed, let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. And, it, and it takes a, 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 a real passion and a real continued effort that, you know, I, I'm hearing you doing in Illinois, I'm seeing that you're doing in Illinois, and it's a real lesson uh, to other states to, to really focus on this. And, and one of the states obviously to focus on in this conversation is, is Virginia. And I, I wanna build on uh, one of the uh, parts of your comments about expungement. Mm -hmm. uh, and Virginia is really facing an expungement crisis right now. There's a debate about how to move forward with it. There's um, a lot of uh, hard heads uh, bumping together uh, on this issue. I think one of the challenges in Virginia, which is also a challenge in Illinois that I think flies under the radar for a lot of people is this idea that um, uh, judicial systems are all electronic and it's easy to identify people right. and everything is advanced. Um, it's not true in Virginia and I've heard you speak on this before. It's certainly not true in Illinois. You still have paper-based systems right. um, in, in spaces. That's, that's county by county. County by county, exactly. And so can you talk a little bit about the challenges that um, Illinois faced um, initially in looking at what this process would be like? And, yeah. and talk a little bit about whether you think it's important for a state like Virginia to wait until legalization happens to address the expungement issues or whether they should get going um, before that happens. Um, I would 100% say get going before that happens. And here's why. One, because it is very complicated. There's no, there's no singular line. Number, number one, if you're on your own and you already are, um, you already have been convicted of an expungible offense, like already under law right now, the process is still difficult, complicated, and and um, sometimes expensive to go through. You need to have access to money. So we also built into this, we have about 13 different waterfalls that come from our cannabis regulation fund, but one of it is legal aid for people to access, you know, help figuring out what this is. So. Um, and then we and then we looked at the the legal way to say what can we compel um, agencies to do that are under the executive branch, and then what are things that you can't compel the executive branch to do? Meaning the legislature cannot direct the governor to pardon the part. The governor needed to use his pardon authority himself to do this, and did it right away. Like right before the law was done, he stood up at a at a podium. I'll never forget this and um, pardoned the first eleven thousand. Um, convictions. And then we, you have to, we had to work with the clerks, the state's attorneys. Um, and, and what's true in Illinois is that we're a state with 102 different counties. Um, and not very, there are lots of places where there are not friendly state's attorneys who do not, like state's attorneys are elected. So when you, when, when you start to break this down or parse it politically, then you have people who are not going to go out of their way to, to help this. So the day that I sat in the courtroom um, for our Cook County State's Attorney, her name is Kim Fox here in Illinois. And she announced her first thousand and personally came into the room. So I'm sitting in the jury box, holding, literally holding the governor's hand and holding my other co-sponsor's hand because I couldn't, I, I could not, it was so emotional because we understood how drug convictions can come seconds apart. Like you can, 20 people can be convicted and they're, they're cruelly efficient. And then I thought I'm watching an African-American chief judge receive a file from the African-American clerk who's now gonna be read by the African-American state's attorney because this African-American woman happened to be a state senator at the time and got to play a role in that. And I, and when I thought about that and what what those judges and clerks and prosecutors and all those people look like they created this system where it was name after name after name and we would hear the expungement language and give breath between each name breath between each name and you can recognize those names those are names that are familiar to me that's what kim says all the time like i know those names from the neighborhood i know those names from my family i know those names and so when i think about how slow the wheels turn at the federal level, how hyper-partisan we are and how divided we are in this country right now, that if you have an opportunity 
to do it at the state level. Like as the former president of the National Conference of State Legislatures, I'll tell you, we always say states are little laboratories of democracy. If you have the opportunity to move for the people in your state right now, use the powers that are inured to the state and do it. Because the only way that we're gonna get the federal mechanism to move faster is, to, is obviously what's happening in, a, across the states right now. We have, to, we have to continue moving. That way we can start to shape what it is they eventually do. When you mentioned earlier about, about legalization is the beginning of these things. And I said that here in Illinois, January 1 wasn't the end, that wasn't the day we solved the problem. That was the day we actually got to start working on the problem. Yes. That was the beginning. And so we wanna, we wanna look at this in 2025 and 2030 to see like what we did when we were, when we were talking about liquor 1933. So when I think about what is coming down the pike and how we can move this national conversation forward, it takes warriors on the ground in state after state after state after state to acknowledge two principal things. Usage rates are the same across demographics the punishment for it is not the same across demographics. And if we are who we say we are, that we are a nation of laws, equal protection under the law, if we, if we really believe that, and you have the opportunity to do that on the ground in your state right now, take it, take it. There have been people who have, I, I just give shouts out to all the advocates and all the people who are on the ground for decades when nobody would listen. And the beautiful thing right now is that everybody's listening. So don't lose the opportunity because everybody is listening. And if there's anything 2020 taught us, this has been a horrible hell of a year, but if there's anything that 2020 taught us, if it's true about vision, it means it's time to see things differently. We need to look at this differently. And if we keep doing everything we've always done, we're gonna keep getting everything we've always gotten. And if you have a chance to do it different, do it. Well, well put, Toy. Um, I mean, I don't know how to even even move on from that because the, those words are so inspiring. Um, our our viewers are clearly very inspired and empowered um, right now, and and I I'm feeling it too. Uh, it's contagious in this room. Uh, to, to build a little bit on expungement, one of the things that I think is so uh, inspiring about uh, the program in Illinois is that it recognizes a really important point. And the way I, I tend to talk about this when, when I'm giving a presentation is expungement fixes one day in a person's life, the day that they got convicted of a crime. What it doesn't fix are all of the days after that where there were missed economic opportunities, educational opportunities, social opportunities, not just for the person convicted of that crime, but for their families, for others in their community. Um, the Community Reinvestment Program recognizes that and mm -hmm. says we need to help not just people who wanna work in the cannabis industry, right. but the people and the communities around those people who have been affected. And expungement is a really important first step but expungement, again, just like legalization itself, is not the last step um, because it doesn't fix all of those days post-conviction that I think a lot of people forget are just as damaging as that conviction in a yeah, lot of ways. Job, that is job training. That's uh, educational things. That's after-school programs. That's violence interruption programs. When you are separate, when your first interaction with law enforcement is negative, um, that is a really good indicator as to how civically involved you'll be for the rest of your life. Yep. That's an indication of whether or not you'll vote. That's an indication of whether or not like you're going to be how, how you interact early on with the government, with the full force of the government is a good indicator. So if we, if it is true that we want to talk about public safety, then we have to talk about communities that have like been impacted by this. I always laugh when people are like, how are you going to keep it out of the parks? I'm like, first you got to acknowledge that it's in the parks. <laughs> That's where we go get it. And if you're how do you keep away from kids in the schools? It's in the schools. So if you really want to talk about public safety, then you got to bring it out of the shadows. You just have to. If you really want to talk about uplifting from an economic development standpoint, just uplifting the amount of people who can be full participants in the economic stream, then you have to remove every single barrier. An arrest will keep you from signing a lease. It'll keep you from getting a student loan. It'll keep you from getting a job if you have to keep checking those boxes. 
all of these things are the web of structural things that are hard to break through unless you systematically dismantle each one of them. And it snowballs. And it snowballs. And so to think that this cannabis conversation is just about whether or not you can have some brownies or if, you know, the, 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 the club of mom wine drinkers, I'm one of them, like grab, I'm one of them, um, can do this nicely in their nice dinner parties and can look the other way as to where that weed came from. If you, if you really understand how all of this stuff is connected, you can't leave any of this stuff off the table. You just cannot, you cannot. So each one of those things, whether they ever want to touch the plant or not, you want, for those of you in Virginia, Virginians, to live their full, true and complete lives without artificial made up um, barriers. And, and that's, again, like you can bloom where you're planted. Like you don't ever, this is, this is so much bigger than whether or not you wanna you know, own. Ownership is important, ownership changes communities. And I talked about all that, that is, that is a whole thing in and of itself. But what I'm most proud of about our, our effort in Illinois is that I wanna change we wanted to change hundreds of thousands of lives. And when I think about what 770,000 records, it tells you how insidious the practice was, how long and ingrained the practice was and is. And it's everything down to when you get through the, the uh, regulatory phase of this, be thinking about putting things in the statute. Like if you say, make sure it's in an odor proof container, there's no such thing as an odor proof container to a canine. There's, no, there's, just no, there, there's nothing on the market like that. However, there might be some really wonderful social equity minds out there that are sitting in college. And if you're the first one to come up with childproof biodegradable mark, you know, labeling and packaging, you might be a bozillionaire. <laughs> All I'm saying is there's a whole ecosystem here. You can bloom where you're planted. It doesn't matter whether you touch the plant or not for why you should care about the fact that we need to do this right. It's no different than if a kid at the Southern part of the state can't read, it should bother you up North. And if whole communities are being oppressed systematically and structurally for decades and decades and decades, it should matter to you wherever you are. And cannabis wraps all of that up in it. It's all in that. So Toby, we've got a little less than 10 minutes left. I want to uh, broaden out from uh, Virginia and Illinois uh, and talk about what's happening moving forward, what's happening at the federal level right now. Uh, you know, Illinois is not the only place that's looking at policy and policy proposals that connect all of these different issues, expungement, community reinvestment, legalization, et cetera. Uh, last week, everyone in this room knows, uh, the House passed the MORE Act, um, the first time that a chamber of Congress has passed a, a piece of legislation as comprehensive in addressing uh, cannabis policy as that, really the second time uh, in history that uh, a Chamber of Congress has even passed a cannabis reform oriented piece of legislation last year, the Safe Banking Act uh, being the first. Can you talk a little bit about what passage of the Moore Act in the House means uh, for this issue, what it means symbolically and, and your thoughts on it generally? Uh, well, I'm thrilled about the historic nature of it. I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, to, to have that 228 people on record for legalization. That is a wonderful thing. And for a concept that, uh, uh, the concept that ties it to um, the criminal justice reform as well. Um, that is a wonderful thing. There's some placeholder language that's in there that I think is gonna be, um, that'll be worked on as, it, as, they, as the new Congress is seated. Um, but in terms of the historic nature of what just happened as an indication for how far this country has come, and in some ways it feels like it's moving very quickly and in other ways it's still moving ridiculously glacially slow. Um, specifically on the MORE Act, that it, you know, like we have to be really careful when we're looking at language. When people say we wanna tax and regulate like alcohol, you know, there are felony exclusion rules in alcohol. One of the things that says, is hopefully this is a placeholder and so we'll be, me and counterparts, we have um, a new group called um, Cannabis Regulators of Color Commission, and we're super excited about that. It's there's not very many of us, many of us in this. Um, unfortunately, the regulators look just like the industry looks, and so we have to really be hard focused on new voices and voices of color across the table um, in this space. But it specific it used it lifted some language from the alcohol um, statutes that allow for felony exclusion. In Illinois, we specifically removed a cannabis conviction as a bar to licensure. So that's what I mean by you can't let any of these things go. If you're gonna talk about the business and the economics of this, 
then people who've been barred from participating in this industry need to be let in. They need to be let in. So that has to come out. <laughs> um, and then we, and then the regulatory structure overall, like there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of, right now we're in this patchwork of regulations across the country. So I'm hoping that as regulators start to uh, organize, we can start to share best practices. We can start to look, you know, like especially states that border each other in terms of harmonizing how we um, deal with all kinds of things from the, like the, the amount that's actually in the plant, like how you deal with medical products, the manufactured products versus the raw flour, supply and demand issues, vertical integration versus uh, independence in this industry. Um, and overarchingly, I'd say this, um, I'm, I'm happy that it's moving, but I'm also very, very focused on making sure that the federal efforts don't undo the equity work that's happening at the states. Because we know who our biggest competitors are going to be. We know that one, like there's a reason why in your neighborhoods, there's hardly any neighborhood pharmacies. We get everything at Walgreens and CVS. If we don't do this right, um, the equity work that is, that, that is so hard fought across this country in cities and counties and like what, you know, what we're doing in, in Illinois could be undone um, in the rush to not really look at the details. And I don't, I am, I'm committed to, to making sure that I work with whoever, you know, wants to join the fight to not lose sight of the people who have borne the brunt of this for almost a hundred years now. I cannot overstate that. So I'm excited. I'm hopeful. There are parts of this that scare me to death. And there are parts that I'm so incredibly proud to be a part of. But I also know that this is just the beginning. And I'm trying to train myself to see things differently. And, and good advice for all of us um, to train ourselves to think differently, to see things differently, to think about this issue in ways that we haven't thought about before and, and really learning from each other in that way. You know, I'm gonna give one little bit of aspiration and then close out while we have a, a couple of minutes left with a, a final question to you. But in terms of thinking about things differently and learning, I, I think as terrible as, as COVID-19 has been um, for public health in the United States and for individuals, it's also really shined a light on something that a lot of us have been familiar with, probably some of us less familiar uh, than we needed to be. And that is the vulnerabilities that exist in a lot of communities in this country, communities of color, the poor, rural America, uh, the currently incarcerated, returning individuals. Um, these are groups that are getting slammed by COVID-19. And it's not because they're biologically more susceptible to it. It's because no. <laughs> sociologically, they are more at risk because of the way that public policy is working. And I think, and I hope at least that those vulnerabilities that have so much crossover to the conversation on cannabis really helps to continue to elevate the issues of justice and issues um, of equity, uh, both racial and economic, social, health equity, et cetera, um, in this conversation, because there's so much overlap that, um, there, um, that exists. And I think, uh, you know, I'd like to see the new administration think about it in that way. Um, I'd like uh, the new Congress to think about it in that way. And I think advocacy organizations, regulators, and others to think about it in that way is going to be critical moving forward. And I, I'll give you a simple way to say it too. Racism is the pre-existing condition. Yes, absolutely. So if, so if we're talking about healing this country, and we're having a huge healthcare conversation right now. That is our pre-existing condition. I'm not genetically more probable to suffer the causes of this, but I am systemically more probable to not have access to quality healthcare, to, to have not, not have access to the same educational opportunities, to not have the same level of wealth, to not have the same, wealth, like all of those things. This is our pre-existing condition. So you can't fix what you can't see. So I'm gonna need people like to stop saying, I love you. I'm gonna work for you. We are all trying to build this together. I love you. I'm gonna fight for you. You can't fight for me. You can't love me. You can't help me if you don't see me. That's well, what this work does. It centers people and we need to see people. Well, well said, Toy. I, I can't thank you enough for joining. I'm uh, sure I speak for all of our viewers in saying that uh, you know, you've done an absolutely amazing job here today, but also you're doing amazing things in Illinois that are helping 
millions of people in that state um, who have been left behind and um, looked over and locked up uh, for decades uh, to get them uh, the beginnings of the type of justice that that they really uh, deserve. So thank you so much um, for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, and for all, all just great job, best of luck. Hit, hit a sister out. Excellent. And for, for our viewers, um, I just want to, I'm going to turn this back over to Ben shortly, but I encourage you to stay on for the 130 session, which will feature a really Virginia focused uh, panel with Jen Michelle Padini, uh, Mark Gibbon and Jewel Bronow, Brono, I'm sure I mispronounced that, Jewel, my apologies for that, um, which will start at 1.30, uh, but Ben, I will turn it over to you for a little segue. Thank you so much, John, and, and thank you, Toy, as well, for um, the inspiration today, as well as the call to action. Uh, and as John mentioned, everyone who's been able to join us, we'd invite you all to um, uh, hop over in 15 minutes to our Virginia specific session entitled Let's Break It Down Marijuana Related Legislation and Reports from the 2020 Virginia General Assembly. Um, we'd like to thank, thank, take this opportunity to thank Virginia Normal for their partnership on the program, as well as Columbia Care and Jushi for their support. Thank you all and uh, see you in just a moment. <laughs>